Imagine you are a senior general in a fascist state. You and your colleagues meet to grill the new prime minister, ensure he is faithful to your regime's principles and the army's aims. He is young, charismatic, but reliable, a lifelong regime man who has supported the military for many years, especially when he controlled the state broadcast network. He speaks eloquently for three hours on the necessity for superficial reform to placate the people, but the substance of the regime will remain unaltered. That's his implication, at least. He wins many of you over when he assures his audience that the Communist Party, the sworn enemy you have fought for forty years, will not be legalized. How would you feel if, several months later, you turned on your TV to see the news that the Communists were to be legalized? Your Prime Minister, the man you trusted and put your faith in, is a liar. He is also, secretly, a democratic fascist. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 10 of History's Most, History's Most Democratic Fascist. I am Peter. And I'm Alex, and I think well, I'm pretty excited about today's episode yeah. because I, I'm, I'm wondering, is this the first time we've kind of talked about somebody that actually is going to get a kind of overall really quite glowing kind of um, assessment from us. You're kidding. We're used to telling bad news stories, aren't we? Yeah. Um, but we're going to focus in on an individual in their career today, and I think we're going to... Well, I'll let you decide, Peter, but I, I'm kind of leaning towards a positive assessment as a historian, if you like. Hmm. hmm. Yeah, you're right. We do mainly tend to look at the uh, the bad side rather than the good side. So this, if if what you're saying is true, if I can believe it, <laughs> um, actually uh, a little positive spin on things. And we need a little positivity in the world right now, so... Yes, yeah. that's true. Yeah. Um, and somebody who um, is was successful in being a, a leader in a crisis. Mm. So, again, maybe, you know... A, a ray of sunshine that not all politicians are well quite as fallible as uh, we might perceive them to be yeah okay well that's good so who is this uh, this man that we're going to be talking about today well we are going to talk about a guy called Aldolfo Suarez history's most democratic fascist um, we kind of teased, didn't we, at the end of last episode yeah. that this was going to be the topic. This is kind of, like I said then, an addendum to the 20th Century Spain series. It's, we're kind of leaping 40 years into the future. Yeah, we're putting a little bow on things after it's all said and done. Yeah. Um, to kind of explain to listeners who might have, you know, enjoyed and listened to our 20th Century Spain series, it ended with the Spanish Civil War, with Franco's victory... But of course, they'll know that Spain today, um, you know, is a democratic Western European nation. Um, and this kind of extra episode helps to wrap that up and say, well, how did we go from the Spanish Civil War in the 30s through to modern Spain? This kind of helps tell that story and, and tie it all together. Okay. So let's start at the end of the Spanish Civil War and the beginning of Franco's dictatorship. So Franco takes power, obviously instates this right-wing government, the, uh, the what, was, what was it called? The Falange, but it had a really hilariously long name again? <laughs> yeah, the, the single party permitted was the Falange. Um, the Feti de la Hions is the um, acronym. Mm. Um, um, but we'll kind of refer to it as as it was generally referred to as the movement or the movimiento, um, which referred to the party, All right. the single permitted trade union or syndicate, and all civil servants as well. Everyone who worked for the government 
was technically part of this movimiento. So it's a single party, it's a single party state, and Franco creates what in many ways looks like a fascist regime, especially in the 1940s, immediately after he won the Civil War. In terms of his foreign policy, who his friends are, mm. um, which is Hitler and Mussolini. Um, in terms of his economic policy, which is called autarky, which is basically like self-reliance, cutting your economy off from the outside world. Yeah. And that was a common fascist economic policy. Um, and in terms of the not just the kind of style of the regime having this phalanche, this fascist party with mass parades and fascist salutes but also in terms of the, the kind of darker side, the repression um, in the immediate post-war years there was um, large scale um, repression of political enemies, of any dissidents there was concentration camps, there was executions, there was mass incarceration um, Franco in peacetime you know in the immediate kind of years after the civil war in the early to mid 1940s had a lot more people um, locked up than say Hitler did during hmm. the peacetime years of Nazi Germany which is kind of uh, a shocking kind of thing to think about but of course that can't last forever um, because fascism goes out of fashion yeah fascism in europe does go out of fashion well europe that isn't spain but it it kind of continues in spain for the next 40 years yeah um so after the 40s the fall of obviously the fascist regimes in 1945 franco is very much a pariah you know he's he's not invited to join the united nations um his regime is kind of like an oddity um, in Europe but he successfully rebrands um, at least on the international stage as a Cold War warrior as a premature anti-communist mm. um, and mm -hmm. builds in the 1950s a friendship and an alliance with the United States of America um, for strategic reasons America is quite prepared to put to one side his fascist past in building up obviously their anti communist alliance around the globe um, and actually one of the reasons strategic planners in the Pentagon like the look of Spain for building air bases and things like that is because um, in a projected war with the Soviet Union the Pyrenees or the mountain range on the border of France and Spain they think looks like a nice defensive line to hold the Soviets back at right so it's amazing how they flip flopped from this 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 man is a, a former fascist and and you know we just fought the fascists and to in a couple of years to ah well maybe he's not so bad because um them russians well exactly um and the money that comes from uh, alliance with the united states in terms of substantial aid basically saves franco's regime in the 1950s because the 40s are known in spain as the hunger years up to about Possibly two to three hundred thousand people died just of starvation mm. in the nineteen forties in Spain because uh, you know the economic policies were so disastrous and the country was covering recovering from civil war. Um, so he's rebranded as a kind of anti-communist rather than an outright fascist, and the Falange, the kind of the style of fascism, of giving the fascist salute and wearing uniforms and marching about recedes and is kind of kept underneath the organisation, the movement the movimiento is still the single party and it's certainly not kind of democratised but from the late 50s into the 60s um, the regime increasingly is influenced by a group called Opus Dei that if anyone's watched the or read the Da Vinci Code is a sinister Catholic conspiracy organization. <laughs> um, it's a real-life organization of kind of Catholics. It's a lay organization. It's not a religious organization. Um, and leading figures of Opus Dei became leading figures in Franco's government. And they began a kind of modernization of the regime through the late 50s into the 60s, 
that really was a spectacular success in terms of it, you know, turned Spain from a very backwards, cut off nation um, into one that had the highest growth um, in the 60s and early 70s in the world outside of Japan, average of about 7.5%. GDP growth per year hmm. um, and a huge amount of this boost came from um, tourism the regime really turned Spain um, into a tourist destination for the first time uh, the beaches of southern Spain became hot spots for uh, European holiday makers yeah. um, and the minister of tourism, a guy called Manuel Fraga kind of really successfully turned Spain into a, a kind of tourist hotspot. Um, they went from having 4.2 million foreign visitors in 1959 to 34.6 million in 1973. Wow. Um, it must be said that all of this is kind of was done in spite of Franco. Franco wasn't keen on the economic modernization program. He kind of had to be persuaded. Um persuaded to support it um, he wasn't keen on any kind of liberalisation measures right up to his death he was giving public speeches talking about the Jewish Bolshevik conspiracy hmm. so he, he you know he wasn't exactly a repentant fascist it was all there under the surface um, but again in the 60s the regime could rebrand as being well we've brought prosperity to Spain yeah <laughs> What kind of so so did they do anything other this 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 uh, Opus Dei um, mm -hmm. organization did did they do anything other than than tourism did they help in you know give I don't know any kind of agricultural prosperity to Spain or what kind of what uh, did they do anything else Well, the focus of Opus Dei was really on modernization. Right. Um, the number of people employed in agriculture really fell dramatically um, because of modernization, mechanization in agriculture, and people move into the cities. Um, and it's part of a wider trend through the 60s and early 70s of the regime becoming less ideological because the personnel in the regime were increasingly a younger generation of people from Opus Dei, people who are careerists, who are bureaucrats, who are technocrats, mm. people who maybe had a kind of vague right-wing conservative worldview, but who were just more interested in either their own career or, you know, being a success and not necessarily wedded to the ideas from the, the 1930s um, that the likes of Franco and the older generation of kind of Spanish politicians had um, but all of it begged the question of course of what would come next mm. because Franco was getting older and older um, by the late 60s he was really increasingly frail and his long term collaborator um, his deputy prime minister a guy called um, Luis Carrera Blanco was trying to kind of forge a continuista plan, a plan for when, once Franco is gone, how can we continue and maintain the regime? Um, because you increasingly, within the regime, had divisions between hardliners, mm. the kind of old guard, who stuck to the old kind of 30s ideologies, who were referred to as the bunker, Right, because the idea being that they were still in Hitler's bunker in 1945 hmm. they were acting like nothing had changed since World War II um, and on the other hand kind of reformers who wanted to modernise the regime were more kind of European minded um, Opus Dei being kind of example of that and Carrera Blanco wanted to kind of try and keep these two factions together and ensure what might be termed Francoism without Franco. Once Franco's died, we'll keep going. We'll keep the regime going somehow. Right. Um, and in 1973, um, he actually was appointed prime minister. Franco remained head of state, but you know he had very little. He was a he was an old man. He was in his seventies, um, and. In fact, I think he was into his 80s. Um, 
and Carrera Blanco have basically taken over the running of Spain. Well, in 1975, Franco does pass away, leaving the question, how does it continue? Yeah, now, what comes next? Now, you, you would think that all these preparations, this continues to plan, would allow for the facilitation of fascism or Francoism to continue. Mm-hmm. But does it? Well... A few things had happened in the meantime. First of all, Carrera Blanco's continuous to plan rested a lot with him personally. He was the kind of political strongman. He was the only one who could hold the regime together, perhaps. Um, And the plan was that when Franco died, he would be succeeded by a member of the Spanish royal family, a guy called um, Juan Carlos, Prince Juan Carlos, Hmm. who had been appointed as Franco's successor back in 1969. Um, he'd basically been raised by the regime um, since the 40s um, and increasingly groomed as the successor. Um, but he was very much to be the figurehead, you know, a head of state, a king. But Carrera Blanco was really going to be running the show. Right. Except um, the 70s, the late 60s and into the 70s, you had increasing opposition to the regime. They began to lose their grip, basically, Um, especially as it became clearer and clearer that Franco's life was coming to an end. Hmm. And you had a number of different factions. You had large-scale student protests, which you saw across the world, you know, from the late 60s. Um, You had communist kind of underground elements working within the official trade union, which meant you had very large-scale strikes and uh, industrial unrest in that time period. Hmm. You had, obviously, people protesting, wanting kind of more democracy. And you also had a terrorist group called ETA, um, which was a Basque country terrorist group that wanted Basque um, independence. And ETA was notoriously effective at assassinating regime figures, policemen, army officers, that sort of thing. And in December 1973, they assassinated Carrera Blanco. Oh. They killed the prime minister. He was a man very kind of embedded in routine, and he used to go to, um, I believe he used to go to a church every morning to say prayers. Right. And he always took the same route, or his car took the same route every day, and they basically put a load of explosives under the road. As he was kind of um, driving along, they detonated it, and his car was flung onto a nearby apartment block. Ooh. Such was the force of the explosion, and obviously he, he was killed. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's still a kind of... Um, a phrase that some Spaniards would use today in kind of jest would be if something's high mm. they say it's as, as high as Carrero Blanco <laughs> um, oh man that's dark <laughs> I know dark you gallows human certainly but certainly you know Etta unbeknownst to them by killing the key to the Continuista plan did the greatest service to the Spanish state um, they could what they ever did unwittingly um, because it meant that we weren't going to see Francoism without Franco. He was succeeded as Prime Minister um, by a guy called Carlos Arias Navarro, um, who, according to uh, Romero, was an astonishing choice, considering he was the Minister for the Interior, which was responsible for security, and um, a terrorist group just murdered (laughs) Prime Minister, and the guy responsible for security is promoted to Prime Minister. (laughs) Okay. Uh, well, which is, in, yeah, you know, we're back in history's most territory here. Yeah. Um, a little bit of incompetence, a <laughs> little bit of bewildering historical story. Exactly. Now, Arius um, was very much a kind of really a figure of the bunker faction. Mm. He was old school. Um, his nickname was the Butcher of Malaga. 
yeah. from uh, overseeing huge scale murder in the city of Malaga during the Spanish Civil War. So he, he was old school. Um, and this meant that, you know, any chance for reform seemed to be lost. And so when Franco died in November 75, really it was just like uncertainty. What is going to come next? Hmm. We're getting closer and closer to the the transition into democracy, and at this point in time, I'm I'm really I'm really curious to to know about how this happens because it's not looking too uh, too likely. You, you know, your mind wouldn't go to oh, they're going to become a democracy here in just a no. couple of years. Yeah, I don't think any Spaniard could have predicted in 1975 how swift the dismantling of the regime and the transition to democracy would be at least without kind of violence or, or without a revolution if you like mm. uh, so when Franco dies Juan Carlos is the new head of state he becomes King Juan Carlos I um, and despite being raised and groomed by the Franco regime he actually beneath it all wanted reform and he wanted to basically transition to democracy because he saw the only future for himself and the Spanish royal family, remember the royal family had been out since 1931, mm. creation of the Republic that we covered um, earlier in the series. He thought the only possible future for the monarchy is along the lines of, say, the British monarchy, a constitutional monarchy alongside a democracy. He thought, I am not going to survive this as king if we try and keep going with this dictatorship. Yeah. Um, so a guy called Fernandez Miranda was his former tutor. He made him his key kind of behind-the-scenes man. And together they were going to secretly work within the regime to reform it, to create a democracy. But for the time being, Arias remained prime minister, which was not exactly a kind of reformist step. Um, and so there was a lot of opposition. Once Franco's dead you get a huge wave of opposition. Um, in the first four months of 1976, for example, you had 17,000 strikes, hmm. uh, 1,600 protests, mass protests, 238 sit-ins. You had 26 ETA assassinations that year. So reformers, people within the regime like Juan Carlos, like Fernandez Miranda who want to kind of reform Spain and move it towards a democracy are stuck between a rock and a hard place because on their right, if you like, you've got the bunker, you've got the hardcore of phalangists and army officers and colleagues of Franco, um, the older generation mostly. I mean, obviously there would be some younger people of that viewpoint. Yeah. Um, but people who were, you know maybe in their 20s or 30s during the Civil War, during the 1930s, mm. who might now be the kind of in their 50s and 60s and be senior figures in the army and in the regime. And, you know, for them, there's, there's a reason, for example, isn't there, that often we keep our tastes, whether it be in music or politics or whatever, that we have when we're in our teens or 20s. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's kind of those... You know, it's a, it's formative experiences and, you know, some things never change about a person. Exactly. So these guys, the bunker people, their formative experience was the 1930s yeah. and the Spanish Civil War. What a formative so for them, experience. Yeah. Um, for them, you know, many of them may well have fought in the war. They have, you know, they have, they would see the crowning achievement of their life as being the destruction of communism as they would see it. Yeah the overthrow of a failing liberal democracy and the establishment they would see of a successful and peaceful Spain for the last 40 years. So they are absolutely opposed to seeing all that trashed. Yeah. On on the other hand, you know, these reformers, they've got the bunker to deal with on that side, on their right. To their left, they've got the illegal, at least at this point, illegal opposition Mm. So the Communist Party, the Socialist Party, the PSOE, um, and obviously all people in Spain who are in favour of democracy, um, which seems to be quite a growing from those figures. 
a large and growing section of the population who, you know, are not happy about the fact Spain's been a dictatorship for the last 40 years. So, like I said, they're between a rock and a hard place. Yeah. How do they maneuver out of that, though? Well, it's very difficult. Um, Now, at first, the reaction of the regime is how it's always reacted to opposition. You know, Arias and the bunker, how are they going to respond to opposition? Well, with repression. Yeah, crack down on it. Um, Exactly. So there was pretty large-scale repression um, in the first half of 1976. Uh, in fact, Arias himself gave a speech on TV in April '76, and he mentioned um, he mentioned Franco no less than seven times during the speech, <laughs> and he blamed the problems overwhelming Spain on an international communist conspiracy. <laughs> um, so you can see the regime responding in the usual way. Yeah, the Minister of the Interior at that time, in the new um, kind of post-Franco. Um, government of, of Arias was a guy called Manuel Fraga who I mentioned before was the Minister of Tourism in the 60s so he was seen as kind of a real reformer and indeed he probably was you know he really transformed the image of Spain in the previous decade but now as Minister of the Interior he took a, you know his Francoist background kind of his instincts if you like come out and um, he famously declared, the streets are mine, um, <laughs> and really led a kind of brutal crackdown on these protests and strikes and opposition. There was particularly an incident in Vitoria, in northern Spain, in which um, there was protests, strikes, and five people were killed by the police. And that played particularly badly. When he met with... Um, the leader of the Socialist Party, which was still illegal at that time, a guy called Felipe González. Um, Fraga said uh, something on the lines of, um, I am power, you are nothing. So you can see even some of the reformers in the regime, when they're faced with a challenge, they respond in the way they've responded for 40 years. Yeah. So unsurprisingly... The, ref- the, the reformers like Juan Carlos, like Fernandez Miranda who are seeking somehow to move this regime away from dictatorship are pretty frustrated and Arias's time as Prime Minister is therefore brief. He actually tells um, I think it's an American journalist when he's visiting the United States that uh, Arias is an unmitigated disaster as Prime Minister <laughs> um, after which point it's quite hard <laughs> for um, for Arias to continue when he clearly doesn't have the king's faith um, and so in June of 76 um, the king Juan Carlos asks for Arias's resignation yeah and who replaces him well the replacement is a surprise mm. the replacement is a, a bit of a surprise a lot of Spaniards might not have heard of him when he became Prime Minister. It was a guy called Adolfo Suarez. Mm. And he is the um he is the the tit- who is who our title is referring to of history's most democratic fascist. I actually told a Spanish friend of mine um where I was gonna make this episode History's Most Democratic Fascist about Suarez and he was like well, he wasn't a fascist, was he? Well it's worth kind of delving into it because um, in some ways he kind of undeniably was and that's one of the reasons why he did actually become Prime Minister yeah um, I would ass- I would assume that's kind of how it would work because if you're part of that establishment if you're part of that party then you're more likely to be mm-hmm. tapped aren't you exactly so Suarez um, was from a kind of middle class family from central Spain he was born in September of 1932 Mm. that's important because obviously he wouldn't remember the um, instability of the republic for him the civil war is a very distant probably very vague early memory from very early childhood Yeah. so what we've just been saying about the bunker doesn't apply to him 
Now, he studied law at university, and then in his 20s, this would be the mid-1950s, he becomes the secretary. He kind of enters government work, um, and he becomes the secretary to a guy called Fernando Herrero um, de Geo. And Paul Preston, an excellent historian of Spain, says that Suarez basically rose on the coattails of Herrero to become the archetypal moving me into bureaucrat. He spent his whole career working for the movement, the party, yeah. within the regime. So he was a secretary to this guy who was a, a Herrero, who was a civil governor in the 1950s. In the 60s, um, Herrero became the deputy secretary general of the movement, so the kind of deputy leader of the single party, um, which meant that Suarez, you know, as his secretary was kind of got to meet the kind of people at the top of the regime. Yeah. He joined Opus Dei. He was obviously um, like an ambitious young man. Mm -hmm. He wanted to rise up through the regime. He kind of, because Herrera was deputy secretary, he got to meet a lot of the top people in the government, in the regime. He befriended the Minister of the Interior in order to get himself appointed as civil governor of Segovia in 1968. So he got himself a nice civil governorship. Um, and as a civil governor, he obviously then gets to meet the next kind of tier up, and he got to meet Franco. Hmm. He got to um, get on friendly terms with Prince Juan Carlos, future head of state. And um, in 1969, Juan Carlos puts his name forward to Carrero Blanco as when they're looking for a new director general of the Spanish state TV network, RTVE. Hmm. So in 1969, he becomes director general of RTVE, which means he controls the state media. Wow. Which is a very nice job to have yeah. if you're a careerist seeking to rise up the kind of greasy pole. Because, well, he can, he used his control of the media, he could promote the image of different ministers, give them airtime mm. in order to build up friendships and alliances. He certainly promoted the image of Juan Carlos, winning the king's favour. He gave airtime um, TV slots to key figures in the army. And he used to apparently send flowers to their wives, <laughs> which, when I heard that, I thought of something different. But apparently, you know, very charming. Yeah. You know, so he's a, in a way, his career up to 1976 is like, you know, quite a slimy, schmoozer kind of politician. Yeah. Who is charming his way to the top by making friends with everyone who's important. Um, I'm sure we can kind of all think of somebody, maybe if you kind of in your career perhaps, who kind of is best friends with the bosses to make sure that they get considered for promotions. Yeah. Um, so when we say, you know, he wasn't a fascist, he was, you know, willingly working his way up through the tiers of a essentially fascist regime. Um, all really for personal gain. You know, he wasn't. He didn't have any strong ideology. He didn't have any strong beliefs. He probably mildly, kind of conservative, at least um, to to kind of want to join the regime. But he's just a careerist, um, and therefore a rather unlikely figure to be one of our few, so far, real heroes. Yeah, who's <laughs> most. Um. He he does redeem himself, though, in our eyes, um, by, um, well, heading up this reformist uh, government, uh, you know, and actually offering a, a real way for Spain to, to become a democracy. Now, how does he, how does he do that? Mm. So, what happens is um, there's a government reshuffle in 1975 in March, so this is about nine months before Franco dies. And uh, his old mentor, Herrero, is made um, the minister secretary of the movement, so head of the movement in right. a single party. And who does he pick as his deputy? Adolfo Suarez. Adolfo Suarez. He's, he's someone he's known for 20 years. 
So Suarez is now approaching the very top. Um, such is his kind of trust and how he's seen by a lot of kind of people in the regime as, as a kind of trustworthy figure and someone who's got the army's ear. He's actually asked to prepare a report at that time on the army's attitudes towards political change. So he's building up more links with the kind of army leaders. Mm-hmm. Um now, actually, Herrera is killed in a car crash in June '75, so before Franco dies, and Suarez actually resigns as deputy secretary of the movement and plays a leading role in leading an organisation called the Union of People of, of the People of Spain, the UDPE. Hmm. Because in the '70s, the regime had tried to put up a kind of false democracy by creating permitted political associations within the regime. Right. So, you know, there's no Communist Party or Socialist Party, but this UDP is an example of within the regime, you can create your own political associations. Now, the UDP actually advocated a continuista position. So Suarez was a leading figure at that time of a continuista position, Francoism without Franco. Mm. Now, after Suarez, uh, after Franco's death... Um, and the king takes over, and in the king's first government, Arias is prime minister still. But Suarez gets into the cabinet for the first time. He's made minister secretary of the movement in December 1975. So he is literally the head of the Falanque, the head of the fascist party. <laughs> so um, he kind of is a fascist in that sense, and that was kind of key to him getting to be Prime Minister. Yeah. Because once um, the King and his circle of advisors decide they want rid of Arias, they can't trust Arias and Arias is never going to reform. So they want a new Prime Minister. Who are they going to pick? Well, there was kind of the leading figure of the reformists. There was either a guy called um, Arielza who was really kind of quite a liberal monarchist. Um, and there was also the aforementioned Manuel Fraga. Now, the trouble is, Fraga's kind of undermined his case with his response to the protests. Hmm. He's not really a credible reformer anymore. And Arielza is too liberal. The, the bunker, the military, wouldn't trust him as far as they could throw him. Hmm. They wouldn't tolerate him as Prime Minister because they'd clearly see he is going to get rid of everything we hold dear. Yeah. Now, most people within the regime see Suarez as essentially a loyal regime man, a creature of the system, the head of the movement. Yeah. Essentially, he's a reactionary. Even a lot of the reformers don't really trust him. They don't think he's a convinced Democrat by any stretch of the imagination. Um... But his close contact with the king, the king's advisors, like Fernandez Miranda, um, helps them to decide he is the person that they are going to place their hopes in for reform. A good example of this was that he'd actually sat next to the king in the 1975 Spanish Football Cup final. Hmm. Um, and they had apparently, watching the game, discussed the benefits of having a young president referring to the presidents of the two teams playing um, the two football clubs um, and how having a young president was a much better idea Suarez by this point was in his early 40s mm. um, and so he was then 75, 76 groomed by the king and the king's advisors Fernandez Miranda to be their vehicle for reform so at the suggestion of Fernandez Miranda he had um, presented to the Cortes, there was a Cortes there was a parliament, it was a regime parliament, you know, there wasn't free elections Um, but he had presented a new law on political associations, kind of a reformist law to the Cortes in June of 76 apparently he'd done it with great kind of style charisma, Mm. the king was so happy with his performance he called him Golden Beak um, I guess we would say maybe silver tongued, but um, yeah, a bit of a bit of a difference in kind of translation there. <laughs> but Suarez is kind of this relatively unknown, fairly inoffensive 
figure who, whereas Arilza is too liberal for the bunker and Fraga is clearly too belligerent for the opposition, maybe Suarez can bring the bunker with him. They'll trust him. Um, whereas, you know, any other figure who's more reformist would surely frighten the military. Right. So Suarez is a bit of a bit of a centrist. Within the regime, I guess you could say yeah. so, yeah. Um indeed I think one of our um one of our candidates for the title of this episode was most radical centrist. <laughs> <laughs> um anyway. July nineteen seventy six, um Arius is gone and the Royal Council have got to present a shortlist to the king of three candidates from whom he can pick the next Prime Minister. And of course, what does Fernandez Miranda do? He makes sure that the Royal Council... Well, he makes sure Suarez is on the shortlist, and he makes sure that Suarez is the kind of safe option on that shortlist. He's a trusted Movimiento figure. And actually, his appointment, while a surprise, delighted the bunker. They were delighted when Suarez became Prime Minister. And the opposition, meanwhile, were absolutely horrified. Mm. The illegal opposition thought, oh no, the regime is going... um, down the opposite route they are not wanting to reform and indeed both Fraga and Arielza, the two more famous reformers both refused to take part in Suarez's government because they thought this is a short lived experiment in failure Yeah. Um, but Suarez I think was you know he was ambitious, he was a careerist yes but he had in the last few kind of months, year to 18 months perhaps he'd recognised which way the wind was blowing Yeah, he kind of realised that there wasn't any hope for a continue Easter if I'm to survive if I'm to prosper if anyone in this regime is to survive, we need to reform Yeah. Um, now there's a brilliant, I want to quote um, to you Paul Preston, who's, you know, well, I'd say the leading historian of 20th century Spain, um, at the very least in English and arguably overall. Um, And he sets out what Suarez was trying to do. Um, So I'll just quote you. He says that um, Suarez set about introducing plans for a more meaningful democratization. He informed his new cabinet that his strategy would be based essentially on speed. He would keep ahead of the game by introducing specific measures faster than the continuistas of the Francoist establishment could respond to them. His programme, announced on television, recognised popular sovereignty, promised a referendum on political reform and elections before 30th of June 1977. It was accompanied by a limited royal pardon for political offences which was well well received in most of Spain. For the bulk of non-politicized Spaniards, however, fearful of losing the material benefits of the previous 15 years, but receptive to political liberalization, the combination of Juan Carlos and Adolfo Suarez was an attractive option. It seemed to offer the chance of both protecting the economic and social advances of recent times and of advancing peacefully and gradually towards democracy. Hmm. So Suarez was kind of cutting a middle path between he didn't want to tear up everything the regime had done but he was going to clearly reform the regime and and turn it into a democracy and I think the really interesting thing there and we'll see it very now because this is going to get very kind of almost breakneck is that Suarez's main focus was speed Yeah, I need to act faster than the bunker than the establishment then the old Franquists can respond. And the other part was that appeal to popular sovereignty, elections, referendums. There's going to be quite a few in the second half of the 70s in order to legitimise what he was doing. Yeah. To kind yeah. of show I have the support of the people in order to cow the bunker into kind of just accepting it. And I think a final thing that comes through from that quote is what did he do? He announced it all on television. Yeah. For a guy who worked for years... 
as the controller of the state media, he understands television. He understands the media. So he comes across as a young, charming, you know, breath of fresh air, really, um, in terms of, you know, look who Spain's been ruled for for, by, for the last 40 years. He is young. He's good on television. He's charming. He's going to kind of take a lot of people along with him in that way. Yeah. So let's run through quickly here the uh, the different reforms that he uh, that he makes to kind of help transition this to a democracy. Absolutely. So we heard in July '76 he announced his plans that you know in less than a year he's going to hold elections. Yeah. Pretty bold considering there's not been kind of free elections for over forty years. Um. So what happens is in September of '76. He has this real crunch meeting with the army, the key army leaders, and of course that's the home really of the bunker. Mm. And he's got to persuade them to support his plan to democratize Spain. Now remember, just uh, you know, a year or so before, he'd been asked to sound out the army about democratization. And when he was head of the TV network, he had been building up relationship with army officers. Mm. That was going to be crucial, right? So the army, basically the bunker, for the time being, trusted him. They trusted his judgment. They trusted he wouldn't tear up the regime, that what he was doing was kind of going to be sensible, limited reform in their eyes, at least. Um, so in this crunch meeting, he won them over. Mm. And he won them over, crucially, with a promise that he would never legalise the Communist Party. Which right. Course, you know, for these bunker figures is really symbolic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, he put the reform plan to the Cortes, the Francoist Cortes, and it was overwhelmingly accepted. They essentially voted for their own destruction, voted to get rid of the institution. Um, and one of the ways they did that, again, was Suarez's charm, public speaking, but also behind the scenes, it was bribes, it was yes, I know you'll lose your seat in the Cortes, but we'll give you this cushy job yeah. in the government, this sort of thing. Um, and then in December of 76, he put it to a referendum, his plan for reform. It won with 94% of the vote. So he's got the army on side, he's got the political establishment on side, he's got the public on side. Hmm. And that's in six months. I mean, that's, that's so quick compared to the pace of what's been going on for the past 40 well, years. Exactly. And like I said, like Preston wrote, his tactic was speed. Yeah. Let's get this done before anyone can stop us. Um, so then in February of 77, you know, he's gearing up for elections in June. He announces the legalization of other parties. Mm. So we've had a single party in Spain, of which he was briefly the head of, for 40 years. And a selection of new parties now comes to, into existence, as well as old parties like the Socialist Party become legalized a number of um, parties grow out of the movement because the movement essentially ceases to exist so you have a far right group um, called uh, Fuerza Nueva hmm. you have a kind of conservative party led by Fraga called AP um, kind of popular alliance and Suarez himself and his allies and kind of regime reformers group around a group called the UCD, the Union of the Democratic Centre. Hmm. Basically, as I say, a centrist kind of group whose sole purpose is creating democracy. Yeah. Um, and then um, he's, he does a kind of really kind of one of those kind of fait accomplis that I absolutely love in, in moments of political drama where something that seems really difficult to achieve you just do it mm. you catch everyone off guard so since um, February of 77 when other parties have been legalised but of course his promise was not to legalise the communists he'd actually been secretly meeting the leader of the communist party a guy called Santiago Carrillo right. right now Carrillo was an interesting communist in that he Embrace something called Euro communism, which was basically an, a, a rejection of the Soviet Union 
and an acceptance of Western European democracy. Hmm. So Carrillo actually, Suarez, whether it was Carrillo was extremely flexible or Suarez was a brilliant negotiator, I don't know. But the communists basically agreed to accept the monarchy, to accept the flag of Spain, which was the monarchist flag, different to the flag the Republic had had, and to accept basically a social contract, to basically accept an end to worker unrest, a kind of agreement between employers and employees, an end to kind of militancy. Um, all of that in exchange for making the Communist Party legal. So Suarez only had to give, you know, uh, one thing. It was a, a big thing, I suppose, but Carrillo agreed to basically give everything that Suarez wanted. And so in a decree in April of 1977, a month before the elections, it was announced that the Communist Party of Spain was now legal. I really want to hear how the, the, old, the old guard reacted to this. Well, <laughs> to give you an impression of it, the newscaster, the, the news anchor who was reading it out, was crying. <laughs> When he read out the words, not in joy, in like yeah, shock in, and fear. In, yeah, um, but at the bunker. How can you react? Literally, the guy you've put your faith in has just broken his promise. But what can you do? The country's in the middle of an election campaign. Yeah. its first election campaign for forty years. I mean, the, this must. What it, are you going to do? It, it must be for 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 the bunker. It must look. You know, it must feel like a car crash that you're just stuck in and there's nothing that you can do but just watch and it's yeah i mean oof. well yeah it's like seeing a car crash up the road yeah like, how can you they were totally blindsided by it um so yeah there's elections in june of 77 new cortez 350 seats so that's 176 for a majority and suarez's ucd win 165 way ahead of any other party mm. um so he forms a government. Um, and it's obviously a per big personal triumph for him and a big endorsement, a public endorsement of what he's doing. So again, what can the regime do? The far right get hardly any seats and even Fraga's AP, kind of Conservative Party, only gets 16 seats. So the kind of bunker are really trapped here. They, 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 they kind of don't know how to respond. Yeah. Um, so, what does Suarez do? He keeps up with that same strategy of speed, because he's now kind of in power with a public mandate as well. So he pushes through a number of things really quickly. He agrees this social contract. It's known as the Moncloa Pact. Um, he brings in the Communist Party and the Socialist Party to negotiate on behalf of the trade unions, and they basically agree in October seventy-seven because the late 70s was a bad time economically for the West, um, to cap wage rises at 20%, even though there's high inflation, and agree to stop kind of the worst of the industrial unrest and strikes in return for Suarez's promises of democratization. So again, he's actually not really promised very much. Mm. It's something he was going to do anyway, but he's got the cooperation of the left. Um, he again shows his kind of negotiating and his kind of directness by he brings in the exiled kind of Catalan hero Catalonia obviously a region that's often dissatisfied brings him in negotiates with him secretly and in later in 77 brings back um, the autonomy that Catalonia had in the Republic time in the 1930s hmm. and the general attack the Catalan self-government is just reintroduced also in October of 77, they bring in a law called the Amnesty Law, which is actually very controversial in Spain now. It's essentially um, an amnesty for all political prisoners, all exiles, all granted impunity from further prosecution um, for ver any kind of political crimes of the Francoist era. So the left is like brilliant because a load of people they've had locked up are released. And it goes alongside a pact of forgetting. That's the kind of informal name for it. This idea that everyone's just going to put aside their differences. Because there was obviously fears and tensions. The hope that everyone would just forget the last 40 years and the Civil War and work together. 
Yeah. Um, now, the reason that law was really controversial is because Suarez wasn't just releasing left-wing political prisoners. The amnesty also covered all crimes committed by the Franquists in the Civil War and during the regime. Ah, uh, right. So everyone who'd got any dirty hands in the Civil War or in the 40 years since, it's fine. You can't be prosecuted. And to this day, you know, that is still in force. Um, and like I say, it is in the last kind of 15 years in Spain, it's become really controversial because there is people who are obviously now old, um, but who were kind of police chiefs in the regime or torturers yeah. who are just going about their daily lives now and can't be prosecuted for anything they did. So Suarez, the democratic fascist, was protecting the fascists back. Yeah. He also, of course, had a not inconsiderable task of drawing up a new constitution. Um, that took a little bit longer, a long negotiation in the Cortes between the different parties. Um, but it was finally presented in October of 78. And its key strength was its kind of ambiguity. Once again, it's pleasing all sides. It defines Spain as a social and democratic state. It's a parliamentary monarchy, a constitutional monarchy. The king is official commander-in-chief of the armed forces, but the prime minister is responsible to the Cortes, the parliament, not to the crown. Right. The death penalty is abolished. Catholicism is no longer the official religion of Spain. It is belatedly hauling Spain into the 20th century. Yeah. Um, and it is approved by the Cortes. Only six members of the Cortes vote against, shown again the extent that he's bringing everyone along with him. And then it's put to a referendum and he gets 88% approval in the referendum. So Suarez is this master of negotiations, of winning over people, both in the Cortes, but also the wider public, of winning elections, winning referendums. And so in March of 79, there's a new constitution in place. So there's elections held under the provisions of the new constitution. And... Um, the UCD wins a few extra seats, seats, gets up to 168, and the the right, the AP, goes down to nine. Um, so Suarez is in, you know, this is the kind of pinnacle of his political career. Um, he has created a democracy, and he has won the public's approval for it. Yeah, it's and impressive. He's done it in two years and a bit. It's really, really impressive. Without any kind of revolution or coup or uprising, he, 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 he did it. <laughs> yeah, he did it. Democracy. It's here. Yeah, and I mean, considering how difficult Spain found democracy, I mean, think about history's worst democracy episode. Yeah. Think about the Republic episode on the causes of, of the Civil War, history's most complicated war. It's remarkable how successful he is. Yeah. How he actually pulls all of this off. Um, he gives autonomy to the Basque country later in 1979. Although it must be said the Basque issue and Basque kind of terrorism remains a problem that he doesn't actually solve. Mm. Yeah, I, I imagine that uh, I, this separatist kind of movement is is... It's a tough question to answer. Mm. So, he's moved all these reforms through. What happens next? Because it, uh, it's... We're moving really quickly here. and uh, Yeah. So, he's been Prime Minister for, let's say, three years we're up to now. I can't think of another leader who's achieved as much in three years. Yeah, um, certainly not their first three years in office. Oh, Especially definitely not. Context, yeah, you know, coming in when he was appointed, he was appointed the prime minister at the head of a authoritarian, semi-fascist dictatorship. Yeah, um, and to tend to do all of this, all these reforms democratically and pretty much all above board um, in three years is, I mean, I gotta say that's a hell of an achievement. But of course, it all catches up with him. Yeah, um, and it wouldn't be history's most if it didn't all go wrong. Um, so, the late seventies I kind of alluded to before, but for the West in general, it was a bad time economically. 
um, you had real crisis across the West, really, economically. And like I said, March 79, those elections are the high point of his career. And after that, it's a rapid decline. Mm. So 1979, 1980, things are getting worse economically. And just like when the Republic was created amidst the Great Depression, people begin to get frustrated and kind of disillusioned because democracy doesn't solve all their problems. Mm. Everyone's excited and putting faith in this new democracy, but just because it's democracy doesn't mean that everything gets fixed instantly. So by 1980, unemployment is 12.6%. It actually rises to 15% the following year. Inflation is at 29%. Um, so there's very serious economic problems. Suarez himself is kind of... Um, he suffers actually a number of painful, I believe, dental problems in 1979, so his health is fading. Mm -hmm. He's obviously gone through an extremely difficult and stressful few years, so he increasingly seems tired, um, withdrawn, Yeah, no longer the kind of young, charming figure that he was when he burst onto the scene. Um, and he's increasingly kind of withdrawing into his own office and small circle of advisors being kept alive on coffee and cigarettes um, mm -hmm. and painkillers for his teeth. Um, more importantly, his party, the UCD, is, is falling apart, it's crumbling, and with it, obviously, his, his Cortez representation, because the UCD is just a random assortment of reformers and kind of people of a kind of Christian Democrat point of view, and moderates and centrists whose only unifying belief was Spain should become a democracy yeah and so once it becomes a democracy what do you get right so the party's falling apart by 7980 because everything they hope to achieve they've achieved yeah and they're kind of losing direction and there's this widespread disenfranchisement disenchantment perhaps with Suarez as unemployment rises, as he seems to kind of fade as a, as a as a political figure. And you get increasing sense among the public that, you know, something's got to change. Now, the bunker obviously still resent it, Suarez, and still resent the democracy. Mm. And they begin to think this public disenchantment, they interpret it as a longing to return to the authoritarianism. Mm. Now, in reality, it probably wasn't, but that's obviously how their worldview, that's how they see it. They see mounting problems in Spain, continued out of terrorism as well, and think, well, obviously the solution is a return to the old ways. Yeah. So through 1980, you begin to get plotting. A number of different plots are kind of coming together. Um... You get hardline bunker figures like a guy called uh, Lieutenant Colonel Antonio Tierro, who is really wanting to go back to Francoism without Franco. And then you get more moderate kind of figures in the army like General Armada, who more want their idea of a coup would be more a touch of the rudder, they would put it as. Mm. Let's just shift Spain back towards the direction we want it. More kind of soft coup, if you like. Yeah. And these kind of plans towards late 1980, early 1981, coalesce. Um, and are suddenly granted a whole load of urgency because out of the blue, in January 1981, basically fed up of it all, Suarez announces he's going to resign. Hmm. And right. it is, once again, his, his arrival on the scene was a shock. His departure is a big shock. Um, people are taken by surprise. So this forces the army plots to accelerate. Um, and it's one of the most dramatic moments that I can think of in political history. On the 23rd of February, 1981, Prime Minister Adolfo Suarez is sat in the Cortes as the investiture vote is carried out for his successor, a guy called Leopoldo Calvo Sotelo, another figure from the UCD and incidentally the son of the Calvo Sotelo murdered in the trigger event for the civil war to start hmm. back in 1936 
And as the speaker is calling on the, the MPs, the members of the Cortez, to vote on the investiture of a new prime minister, well, something very dramatic happens. This coup is, I, I think, the only one that was filmed, like, for, for television. Hmm. Because, of course, the cameras were in to the film Investiture of a New Prime Minister. So, it's freely available on YouTube if you, go, if you type in 23F, which was the name of the, clip, the coup plot. I'm going to play you a little bit. Let's hear it. So that's Tero marching in, and everyone's just staring at him. He said, everyone, stay where you are. Get on the ground. And everyone's just staring in bewilderment. There's a full parliament, Cortez. No one knows what's going on. And suddenly the room is flooded. with 200 civil guards armed police who begin shooting the ceiling <laughs> so, so I mean it, you can watch it. it is insane it is insane I mean imagine uh, picture you know for our British listeners the House of Commons our American yeah. listeners you know Congress picture or wherever you are in the world your national parliament picture soldiers marching in during the investiture of a new president or prime minister firing their guns telling the politicians to get on the ground imagine that happening it's it's I can't, I can't I can't imagine it well I mean maybe I can a little bit but not in any way that actually would work um, not in any way that actually would result in any change which uh well, this doesn't. <laughs> this certainly doesn't, does it? I mean... So it, it's, it's, it defies belief. I, I Maybe we'll put it in the episode description, a link. Yeah. I, Watch it. I, what I, happens is... Uh, oh, go on. I, I do have a question about what was going through their minds during the plotting of this, because, like, hmm. there's no way that this was going to actually work, right? I mean, this the the... the the democratic system was kind of too big to fail at this point in time to be kind of brought back in a military coup, uh, military coup in 1981. Well, in the mind of people like Colonel Teero was the fact, you know, bunker type figures that the, oh, democracy's failed. We'll march in. We will seize the politicians, creating a power vacuum and a proper military Francoist regime can be installed under the king as head of state. In meanwhile, the more soft coup general Armada wants to rectify democracy, push it more in a direction that he thinks is appropriate. And again, this dramatic situation, what he hopes is he'll be invited to head a new national emergency government and he can kind of fix democracy the way he wants it. Yeah. So they march in at 20 past 6 in the evening. Tero, Tihero marches in himself, uh, which is why the first scene is so confusing. He marches up to the speaker's podiums, just saying, everyone get on the ground, stay where you are. And everyone is just sat in their chairs, frozen, just looking at him like, what on earth are you doing? What is this? But then suddenly, these 200 civil guards storm in, and the deputy prime minister, a general, a uh, former general called um, Gutierrez Melado, leaps out of his chair. He was sitting next to Suarez. Um, if you watch the footage, Suarez is sat on the far end of the, the far left side of the, the U. It's in a U shape. And it kind of, that's where the prime minister sits. And he leaps up. Suarez kind of reaches for him to stop him and grasps his jacket. <laughs> And he marches down to Tero and demands as his kind of military superior, like, what are you doing? 
um, stop what you're doing, um, stand down, give me your gun. And then there's this scuffle. The civil guards come in, start firing into the air, which you heard with their machine, submachine guns. Um, this 68 year old general, the deputy prime minister, just stood there. There's a hilarious kind of scuffle as Tierro tries to kind of push him to the ground. Hmm. He stands his ground. Suarez kind of half gets out of his seat, considers going to help him, protests, um, but then kind of sits down with Melado kind of resignedly. And one of the one of the kind of absolute incredible moments is that when that firing starts, everyone runs under the tables and chairs. Mm. Everyone ducks for cover, or the politicians at least. And the only man st- still there is Suarez, just leaning, <laughs> leaning back in his chair, watching this unfold. You've got to remember, this is the end of his political career. This is his successor. He's still technically prime minister because the vote hasn't finished. But this is a success successor being sworn in. I know there's that phrase, everyone's political career, you know, every political career ends in failure. Mm. he's sitting there thinking this is the end of my career literally, metaphorically, figuratively, whatever and he is watching his project the reform to democracy the end of his premiership is soldiers coming in firing their guns <laughs> in trying to stage a coup um, about an hour later he decides to stand up because they're all just sitting there cooped up while the army waits for a coup to happen and actually army units did go onto the streets in Madrid and in Valencia he sits up um, and he's told by some soldiers, Mr Suarez stay in your seat (laughs) Um, sit down damn it Um, but he's basically grabbed by Colonel Tierro, led away um, and Suarez says you know, what is this madness um, I am the Prime Minister of Spain, which actually in Spanish is the President of the Government. Right. But Prime Minister is a better translation because in English, President means Head of State, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Right, Head of Government. Um, to which um, Tierra replies, You are not President, you're no longer President of anything. Um, <laughs> but they have, they have the key leaders locked up here in Parliament in the Cortes and they hope that um, this power vacuum will allow the army to seize power but Tierro although he's kind of leading the coup he's not really doing anything he's just got the leaders cooped up that's his job Yeah. and he's waiting for someone else to take power Um, and that doesn't happen because at um, 1.15 in the morning a.m. The King of Spain appears on live television. Juan Carlos, wearing the uniform of Commander in Chief, which he is. Mm. And he basically says, not in my name, that the army needs to stand down, that we need to stick to the Constitution, that we can't interrupt the democratic process. Mm. And of course, to a large number of the army plotters, no matter what, they are loyal to their oath and they can't disobey the orders of the commander-in-chief and after all, their coup is aimed at installing a regime similar to Franco's with the king as head of state Yeah. so if their coup to invest all power in the king has not got the support of the king well, what do you do? there's nowhere for them to go and so the coup really ends in a damp squib um, the following morning I, uh I assume that Tahero is uh, is arrested. He's arrested, yes. Um, he gets off pretty lightly, it must be said. Um, he he goes to prison for a little bit, but um, that's really about it. He's still alive today, I believe. Uh, yeah, I, I presume he's out. Yeah, he did. Um, he was released in 1996. He did 15 years. Um, so there you are. <laughs> yeah, Wikipedia says that he's uh, he's 87 currently. So uh, to Hero, if you're listening, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> We're glad he failed. Yeah, um, but no, that's the end of Suarez. Um, he 
His UCD party falls apart. He sets up a new party called New Centrist Party called the CDS. He continues to be elected as a member of the Cortez for the rest of the 80s, but his CDS party never really goes anywhere. Mm. Um, and so he, um, at the end of the 80s, he retires from public life. And unfortunately, in his later life, he contracted um, Alzheimer's and he mm. died in 2014. Um, but he died um, kind of when he when he left office in 81. Like I said, it, it, had all, it was all over, it, you know. Yeah political career seemed to have ended in failure he, he'd achieved what he'd set out to and he was left kind of directionless um, and kind of he wasn't really liked by the left or the right because the left wanted to now get into power now that democracy had been established and the right obviously resented how much he'd changed um, but by the time he died he was kind of respected and you know, seen as a real kind of national figure of importance. Yeah. To the point where, um, when he did die, Madrid's main airport is was named after him, and is is named after him. Um, mm. Which you know, it's a nice symbolic thing for a former literal head of a fascist party. Yeah, is <laughs> quite remarkable, and I think. Suarez is a really interesting man. He's he's someone that you know we always look for people who are overlooked, perhaps who aren't remembered. And I think in the English speaking world, he is. There's not even a biography in English of him. Oh yeah. Um, there's a fantastic book by Javier uh, Cercas um, called "The Anatomy of a Moment," which is a real kind of gets under the skin of that moment of the coup, twenty three F. And goes into fantastic detail of each character. The author admits it was originally a novel, but he realised the novel was never going to work, um, and he didn't want to mythologise such a already mythologised moment yeah. in Spanish history. So he turned it into a into a history, and it's a, I would really recommend it. It's a fantastic book. Um, it's one of my favourite books. My, one of my favourite books, not necessarily history or fiction or whatever. I just I think it's fantastic. I think it's yeah. amazing. And it goes obviously into a lot into Suarez's career, and I think it's he's an amazing man. Um, like we said, his background not only in a fascist regime, but his kind of ruthless, smarmy careerism mm. for him then to become such a successful and visionary democratic politician is is really quite something. Certainly, I mean it, it's. I was gonna. I was gonna say. I think that there's a little bit of comparisons to be drawn between Suarez and Primo uh, de Rivera, in the way that you know it's someone who origi- who is who succeeds originally in 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 accomplishing their goals, yeah, but whose popularity ultimately wanes, and you know, I mean, what what else is there more to to say? <laughs> You know, All political careers end in failure. Exactly, exactly. I think that's probably the best thing that you can say here. His career has, for me at least, has such a certain romance and drama to it. You know, the oh yeah, going from the trusted fascist, the reliable movement figure, to the remarkable speed is my only option. Blitzkrieg democratization. Mm-hmm. To his final moments as prime minister, being him literally sitting watching a military coup unfold in front of him. Oh yeah, I mean um, it, it, it is dramatic and it is it, it's it's bizarre. Um, By but, the way, just at a complete side note, one of the fascinating things about Twenty Three F is, according to like opinion polls and kind of, I guess, qualitative data. Most Spaniards, or at least who are old enough, will say they can remember it. They can remember watching 23F live on TV, that scene I've just described to you. Bit of a flashball um, moment. But it was not broadcast live on TV. <laughs> it was recorded for TV. Because uh, it was going to be on the news, the new Prime Minister being sworn in. Um, and the footage, obviously since then, has become very widespread, very widely known in Spain. Yeah, you know, Everyone's seen it. And I'm sure it's been on documentaries and things like that. But because everyone's seen it, they imagine themselves watching it live on the night it was happening. Ah, when yeah. It was never broadcast live. Yeah, um, I one see. One of those fascinating things about history and memory. Um, 
but yeah. What yeah. do you think? At the start of the episode, we said, um, well, I said, I think he's actually one of the few kind of heroic figures that we've covered in history's most. Yeah. And we kind of said, do you, I was, we were kind of saying, are you going to come to the same conclusion by the end? What, what do you reckon? I think so. I, I, I would say that, you know, he, he is one of the few positive figures that we've covered. I mean, you know, we we talked about, like I, like I said, you know, Primo de Rivera, we, we touched on some positive notes mm -hmm. in his career, which there definitely are. And there's, you know, it, it's important to, to mention that. But I think, on the whole, Adolfo Suarez is probably the most... Um, the person that we can look up to the most on on history's most. I mean, I, you know, I I tread very carefully there because you know he 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 was a, f yeah, head of the fascist party. But I think in my eyes, he kind of redeemed himself by working towards democracy. Um, it, yeah, I think I think I, that's. I, I I struggle to imagine that our listeners would be able to suggest a more democratic fascist. Yeah, certainly I think not for for the first time. We could say a most with extreme confidence. Yeah, no it, one could possibly disagree with us. This is this is a dot on that question, but I'm always open to be challenged. Oh yeah, we're always Come open. Us. Come at us, bro. I mean, you know, we've we've always got, um, you know, our email is always open. We're always looking for suggestions, and uh, if you think that you have a more democratic fascist. Um, by all means, please send us an email, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll 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 talk about it. We will uh, certainly take a look, and you know we'll mention it. Absolutely. Can I? Can we end with one final um, kind of appeal? I'll say. Sure. Um, and I promise it's not going to be asking people to buy my book. Um, <laughs> We would really love it and appreciate it if as many of our listeners as possible were to review History's Most. Um, a lot of podcast platforms, I know Apple Podcasts does, allow you to rate the podcast, give it you know, a star rating. Mm. Um, you can write a review. We don't mind, so long as you leave some sort of feedback, a review, a star rating. It makes an awful lot of difference to the podcast which obviously um, in terms of like people being able to find it coming up in people's kind of suggestions that sort of thing we'd also kind of direct you to our page on Podchaser Podchaser is like uh, IMDB but for podcasts obviously um, and you, we've got a page for History's Most you can leave a rating or a review for the podcast you can also which I think is really cool um is you can rate and review individual episodes, mm. um, which is kind of a nice little feature. So it would be pretty cool, actually, to see if our listeners have preferences, like what topics we've covered, so we know more that you'd like to hear. Um, mm. Certainly we're going to, I think, in the next few weeks, maybe cover, move away from the 20th century a little bit for the time being, because we have overwhelmingly covered that yeah the 20th century kind of has been our main focus so uh if if the listeners uh would like us to move away from that or would like us to you know focus on one particular type so political history or military history you know uh or anything else then you know let us know give us a review yeah, absolutely. um review us, but also you can tweet us email us with any of that kind of feedback or suggestions we're always open to ideas for new mosts um and quite recently actually we have uh been interviewed uh we've got an interview up on chathistory.org um and we kind of talk a little bit about our uh, our you know backgrounds in history mm -hmm. and our um political kind of you yeah, know, some, yeah, some yeah. political was, questions and things. It was, it was a really interesting interview. He, he specifically, um, Zachariah, who runs the website, had um, listened, did it off the back of listening to our primo episode, His yes. Most Relevant Dictator, and he asked some really interesting questions. It's, it's a written interview that you can go and read. I'm sure we'll link it in the description. Yeah. Um, but he asked some really interesting questions about kind of dictatorship and... Um, you know, from Roman times to today, and the kind of advantages and disadvantages. So, I, I, I hope you enjoy reading that. It's, um, 
it was some interesting questions to answer. Yeah, it was it was interesting to think about, you know, especially in terms of like comparing Primo's kind of dictatorship and talking about modern politics at the same time, kind of mm-hmm. finding a way to compare and contrast the two. It, it was yeah, it was a very very good interview, very fun interview to to kind of think about. Yeah, absolutely. Great. All right. Well, well, we hope you enjoyed this episode, everybody. And um, again, if you um, like us, give us a give us a review, rate us, um, look us up on Pod Chaser, and of course, we are on Twitter at Histories Most. Uh, we have an email address, uh, Histories dot Most at Gmail dot com. That's Histories without an apostrophe. And I think that's about everything. Absolutely. I mean, it would mean so much for us if you leave, you know, feedback, reviews, ratings on any of those places, any platform, and spread the word because, you know, we obviously really like doing this and that's the best way that you can kind of help us out and support the podcast. And it takes, you know, literally two seconds of your time. Yeah. You can open your phone right now as you're listening and just tap a star rating. We'd so appreciate it. We definitely would. All right, well, I have been Peter. And I've been Alex, and thanks for listening to History's Most. (laughs) 